Hello, hello, and welcome back to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly podcast on the Fab Four, in which we talk about anything we want to, where the Beatles are concerned, anything about the past, the present, sometimes even the future, their music, their history, and analysis when we feel like it. Sometimes we have special guests on our show, as we will on this one. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts on this show, known for my syndicated Beatles show, radio program called Every Little Thing, another talk show podcast on the Beatles, only on the solo careers of the Beatles, called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and also my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with interviews all discussing the Beatles. And I'm being joined by my two regulars. First of all, a man who's been manning the fort at New York's WFUV <laughs> for almost 40 years there, putting on great shows and, you know, something to say when you're at the same radio station in this business for that long a period of time. That's quite remarkable and rare, to say the least. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Oh, Hi, well, thank you. I blush. I'm blushing. <laughs> Ken, thanks so much. I appreciate the kind words. It's going to be officially 39 years since my first show next month. So I'll have a I'll have some cupcakes for you guys. Okay. All right. We'll bring it to the fest. Right. We'll all share in it. And then we'll get a big cake for Alan's book. Alan and Adrian. We also have Alan Cozen with us. He is the co-author, as I just mentioned, of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Also, previous books on the Beatles, Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, many years working at the New York Times in their classical department. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, hey, Alan. Uh, I'm very excited about our show this time because we have a very special guest that we'll be bringing on momentarily, who's done quite a lot of work with Ringo in particular. He's had a tremendous career in the music business as a songwriter in particular. And um, like I said, quite a lot of work with Ringo. We'll talk to him in just a few moments. But as usual, we get to the latest in Beatle news, and there isn't too much to report this time out. But we'll start with very big news about Ringo, that he and his all-star band will be back on the road again for a spring tour with dates on the west coast of the U.S., running from May 19th to June 17th. Altogether, 19 dates in total, with Ringo hitting California, including, again, the Greek theater, uh, Nevada, the Venetian Theater in Las Vegas for three shows, also in Arizona, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Utah. And with special thanks to Scott O'Rourke, one of our regular listeners, there's a new movie trailer for an upcoming film called Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which includes George Harrison's What Is Life in the trailer. In fact, it's there. The trailer's about two and a half minutes. You can see it online. What is life is there throughout the whole thing. <laughs> and not only that, but you even get to hear what we also heard and what's been bootlegged for years in the All Things Must Pass box set, where it's kind of stripped down and you hear other brass parts that were mixed down in the final mix. You can hear that in the trailer. So um, hopefully there'll be a soundtrack and What is Life will be on there. But nice to see What is Life getting this kind of attention my wife and daughter were just watching that trailer literally within the past hour or two really well, really coincidental and i heard because i heard what is life playing hmm. and 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 asked them what they were watching i'm always happy these days to see beatles music or, or solo music in films or tv shows any which way you can get the music out there and other audiences and young audience can, can hear it, that's a good thing. Of course, we have a very major passing to announce that everyone's heard about, that being legendary guitarist Jeff Beck, one of the great guitarists in rock and roll. Paul McCartney went online and gave a touching tribute to Jeff. He's quoted as saying, I was so saddened to hear that Jeff Beck had died. 
Jeff Beck was a lovely man with a wicked sense of humor who played some of the best guitar music ever to come out of Great Britain. He was a superb technician and could strip down his guitar and put it back together again in time for the show. His unique style of playing was something that no one could match, and I will always remember the great times we had together. He would come over to dinner at our place, um, or he and his wife, Sandra, would host an evening at their house. Jeff had immaculate taste in most things and was an expert at rebuilding his collection of cars. His no-nonsense attitude to the music business was always so refreshing, and I will cherish forever the moments we spent together. Jeff Beck has left the building, and it is a lonelier place without him. God bless Jeff and his family. Love, Paul. Very nice words there coming from Paul mm -hmm. McCartney. And Peter Asher had this to say. We're saddened by the news of the passing of the great British guitar icon, Jeff Beck. He was one of the coolest, most self-effacing guys I've ever met. Peter said this on the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. He says some of the stuff he played over the course of his career was completely unbelievable. That live at Ronnie Scott's album is some of the best music ever put on record. Um, he also says that Jeff was on Peter Asher's earliest production efforts, one of his earliest ones, playing lead guitar on both sides of the 1968 Paul Jones release and The Sun Will Shine, backed with The Dog Presides, which had Paul McCartney playing drums, Nicky Hopkins on piano, and uh, Paul Samuel Smith on bass and Paul Jones on vocals. Of course, Paul Jones the former lead singer of Manfred Mann. Listen to Do I Diddy Diddy. And that's Paul Jones there. So Peter Asher produced this. I think this was his very first Thank recording, you. recordings as a producer. And Paul McCartney was on drums on that. And Jeff Beck played on those sessions. And Peter says, uh, this genius of a guitar and true innovator will be sorely missed. Two of Jeff Beck's albums happened to be produced by George Martin, 1975's Blow by Blow and 1976's Wired. On the Blow by Blow album, Jeff recorded his own instrumental version of She's a Woman. He later recorded A Day in the Life, and that appeared on a George Martin album called In My Life, of various artists covering Beatles songs and a few George Martin compositions. The album produced by George, and that was released in... 1998. A reminder that Denny Lane will be on tour with seven dates on the East Coast so far, mainly of shows at the city winery locations in New York, Montgomery, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and new shows on Long Island, in Pittsburgh, and West Yarmouth. That's in Cape Cod. To view the entire list, you can always go to the concerts and events page on my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. Also, the Fest for Beatle fans is coming up March 31st, April 1st, and 2nd at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson. An updated list here of special guests includes Peter Asher, Patty Boyd, Mark Rivera, Terry Sylvester, Joey Mollen, Mark Lewison, authors Jay Bergen, Bruce Spizer, Ken Womack, David Bedford, Pierce Hemmingson, Susan Ryan, and our very own Alan Cozen. Really the headlining name there of all the names on the list, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. More people will flock to see Alan than, than anybody here on the list, I would think. Um, probably Mark, I would say. They probably <laughs> I hear Andrew Lloyd Webber wants to stop by and <laughs> say hi. Not writing a book Especially. about it. <laughs> wants to have a drink with you, Alan. <clears throat> also want to let you folks know that um, Gary Burr, who for many years uh, and still in recent years has worked with Ringo Starr, um, he's going to be performing locally uh, on the East Coast. He'll be at the Kate, which is in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, on January 27th. Actually, that is the uh, Laurel Canyon Band. It's a Crosby, Sills, Nash & Young tribute band. And Mark Hudson's in the group and Mark Miranda. So again, that's January 27th at the Kate in Old Saybrook. Also, um, Gary, along with his wife, Georgia Middleman, 
We'll be playing a show at the Cutting Room in New York City. That's on May the 19th. Um, also, before that, uh, on February 2nd, at the uh, Mule House in Nashville, uh, Gary will be performing with uh, Tony Ariate. Okay, so that's all the news that we have this time. And there you go. As I said earlier, we have a very special guest here on the show this time. It's Gary Burr. And Beatle fans know him for his work with Ringo and doing a lot of work in the studio as a musician, writing a lot of songs with Ringo. But he's had an amazing career before that, during that, and still to this day. He's one of the most successful songwriters, especially in the country field. You'd be amazed at all the artists that he's written songs for. And he's also in a band with his wife, Georgia, and Kenny Loggins. There's, there's so much to talk about in his career. But uh, we welcome Gary Burr to Things We Said Today. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, before, applause. I'd, I'd really like to get into, um, to talk about the early part of your career, because um, we'll be covering Ringo, I'm sure, quite a lot a, a little bit later on. All right. But, um, your career, you, you've done so much as a songwriter, and... Uh, just to to give folks an idea of all the people that you've written songs for, I'll read this as quickly as I can. It's such an impressive list. Juice Newton, Lady Antebellum, Patty Loveless, Reba McIntyre, The Oak Ridge Boys. You actually um, helped to write a song for Joey Mullins. Oh, that's right. Hardway Twitty, Kenny Rogers, Winona, Tim McGraw, Garth Brooks. Leanne Rimes, Diamond Rio, Randy Travis, The Oak Ridge Boys, Faith Hill, Leonard Skinner, <laughs> uh, Tommy Shaw, Clay Aiken, and Joe Cocker. How's that for an impressive list? Plus Ringo. <laughs> That's right. So was it always your dream to have this career primarily as a songwriter? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This was, I, uh, I, thought I was going to be an artist. That's what I wanted to be. Mm. I went to Woodstock back in 1969. I went to the original Woodstock wow. and I was supposed to be an electrician and take over my dad's business. But I sat there at Woodstock and the my takeaway from it was the guys up on stage were definitely getting more chicks than electricians were. So I, the guy I was sitting with, I knew he played the drums so I asked him if we went back to town, if we could start a band, if I got better at the guitar. So I came home. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a weird story. Uh, I came home. I was playing soccer for my high school team and I got my leg broken and I was in a body cast from my nipples down to my toes and I was flat on my back. And all I had was a stereo and my brother's guitar. And the th I had three albums that I was like learning how to play guitar to. And it was Tapestry, a, a Beatle album, and a Pure Prairie League album. And during my career, I became the lead singer of Pure Prairie League, played with Ringo, and toured the world with Carol King. Now that is weird kismet. <laughs> but I learned how to play guitar. I got a record deal eventually. And as soon as my record came out, the record company went out of business. So the guys that were helping me, my mentors said, let's try selling songs while we get you another record deal. So we started selling songs. We started getting our songs cut. And uh, I'm still waiting for a record deal. Is songwriting something that always came easy to you? It Now... You know what? It came real natural to me. Hmm. The only reason I ever wrote songs was because when that when that guy and I started a band, all the cover songs from other bands that we played, like the Stones and the Birds and, and Beatles, the songs were mostly written by the guitar player. So the band all looked at me and said, you're our guitar player. You're supposed to write our songs. So I just started writing songs at that point. 
and they were awful. And then little by little, they got a little better and a little better and a little better. And until it got to the point where I would show them to professionals and things started to take off. Wow. Now, considering the fact that so much of your material has gone to country artists, did you always have leanings in country music? I know that Sweetheart of the Rodeo um, just, boom, t- took me off into a, a, a tangent that I never came back from. It was just hearing the steel guitar and the harmonies. I always gravitated, you know, I, I always liked, you know, what goes on more than Lady Madonna, you know, because oh. I like, I like, I gravitate more towards um, country rhythms. And I don't know why, but, uh, you know, once, once I started, once I heard that album and I started to lean and go into uh, Poco and then the Eagles, mm. I, I saw that uh, everything from my hands and mouth at that point started to sound like that style. Wow. So I would guess maybe even with, with early Beatles music, you must have really dug the, the rockabilly stuff, probably the Carl Perkins music, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. You know, uh, I've just seen a face, stuff like that. I just, you know, a, a lot of that stuff is very, you know, now that I'm in the country world, I can look back and go even, you know, you won't see me. That's a, you know, that sounds more like a country song than anything else. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I really, I really, as much as I wrote country, I also wrote Beatley because it was in my DNA. And that was one of the things that everybody down here in Nashville took to. When I started sending my songs down, I was the guy that wrote the Beatley songs from Connecticut. And they loved that. There was nobody down here. They were all writing Willie and, and Chris and Johnny Cash. And I was writing, uh, you know, Lennon McCartney style stuff. Mm -hmm. So that made me really stand out. And, uh, you know, no matter what I sent, they called and said, what else you got? Interesting. Um, As a Beatle fan and also as a country music fan, what did you think of Ringo when he made a country album with Bukus of Blues? Were you aware of it when it happened? I was aware of it when it happened. I don't think I ever really listened to it. Um, I'm not sure if I ever listened to it. Uh, you know, I was never so much of a fan that I just had to listen to everything any of them did. Mm. If I heard something on the radio that that made me think, gee, I'd like to check out the rest of the album, I'd buy the album. But uh, no, I, I really didn't listen to that record because he he really likes old style country and i wasn't so old style you know he he goes his collect his record collection for country goes back to the guys that inspired hank williams Mm. you know the generation before hank williams he knows those guys Mm. so that's a little bit you know uh, that's a little bit before my love started. Mm. We mentioned this uh, a few shows ago with the passing of uh, Ken Mansfield. Um, He's someone who was very close to Ringo in his solo career, and he was responsible for mailing country albums to Ringo from the U.S. to him in England. And Ringo was a big fan of Outlaw music and Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings. Were you a fan of that as well? To tell you the truth, I didn't, when I moved to Nashville, by the time I, by the time I started to hit and and get traction in Nashville, Hmm. I was not a fan of Nashville country music. When I moved to Nashville, and to this day, I've never heard a Waylon Jennings album. I've never heard a Willie Nelson album. I've never heard a Johnny Cash album. I just, that's, I don't, that's not, that's not what I love. 
and it's not really what I write. So, you know, I, I came down here kind of with a blank slate. Really interesting. The first song I was aware of that you wrote was the hit for Juice Newton. Right. It's been a little bit hard on me. Was that your first hit? That was my first cut of, of anything. I was sitting, I was working, I was an electrician. And I was, you know, crawling around through people's attics during the day. You know, in Connecticut heat, I'd be up in the attic, it'd be 140 degrees in the attic. And they used to tie a rope around my ankle. So if I died, they could pull me back out through the hole in the ceiling. And uh, every night I'd try to scrub the fiberglass out of my pores and go down the basement and try to write a song that would make me not have to be an electrician. And, uh, you know, I was writing stuff that was way too, I was writing what I was listening to on records. I was writing um, Dylan, long Neil Young style songs, um, you know, Harry Chapin, things like that. Hmm. And and then one day I just decided that, that I was going to listen to the radio a little closer and see because you don't hear those things on the radio because they're too long. I was trying to figure out what made the radio songs radio songs. And it's it was shortness. It was repetition. It was a certain lowering of the uh, of the aspirations of the lyric. And so that's when I sat down and and started writing uh, the Juice Newton song. Love's been a little bit hard on me. And I just thought it was so simple and dumb that I stopped writing after about 45 seconds. But it was, I still sent it in to the guys that were helping me in New York and they went gaga over it and said, you got to finish it. So I finished it. We recorded it and they had connections in Nashville and they sent it down and, and somebody at Bobby Goldsboro music took it to Richard Landis who recorded it for Juice Newton. And next thing I know, I get a phone call saying, I'm going to have a song on the radio. So I went into work and dropped my tools on my boss's desk and said, I quit. <laughs> and then my friends told me, you know, it takes nine months to get the money. So I went back in the next day and pulled a George Costanza and came back in and said, I'm back. <laughs> and I just worked another nine months and went in and went, I quit. Now, just before I pass you over to my colleagues here, um, when you write a hit record like that, do the publishers say, give me another one just like that? Yeah, so they want more formula. So, yeah, very formulaic, you know. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, another interesting story, uh, for Juice because it was such a big hit. Her yeah. producer, Richard Landis, called me and said, "What else you got?" So I sent him a bunch of songs, and he picked a song and said, "I love this song." Uh, we're going to Japan. Bring eight copies of this song, and the band's going to learn it on the way to Japan. I got and come to Boston. Uh, Juice is opening for Peter, Paul, and Mary. So I'm all excited. I go to Boston. I go backstage. I give him the tapes, and he goes, well, we got a little problem. The song was called Shaking the Night Away. And he said, we got a little problem. I said, what? He goes, uh, we think that the song needs a bridge. There's no bridge. We wish it had a bridge. Hmm. I said, oh, I, I can write, I'll write a bridge. He goes, okay, great, great. But also, uh, we think that the uh, the lyric is too dark. We need it to be a little, can you make it a little happier? I go, yeah, I can make it a little happier. He goes, also, the melody in the chorus, we <laughs> wish, was a little stronger. Could you work on that? Yeah, I can. Also, yeah, I mean, truth be told, the melody in the verse is a little, you know, maybe, and I stopped him. I said, what do you like about the song? And he looked at me and he said, it's a great title. <laughs> and they never cut the song. That's funny. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that they were going to, they were going to complain that the title was too much like twist in the night away. Yeah. No, <laughs> the only thing no. they liked was the title. <laughs> the only thing they liked was the title <laughs> and, and the band restless heart ended up cutting it just the way it was. Oh, very good. All right, we're going to do this like a round robin here. I'm going to pass you over to one of my uh, colleagues here, and let's let's uh, let's. Who hear gets me? Who gets me? Yeah, Darren, you're next. 
All right. And thank you for taking some time to talk to us, Gary. I find it interesting that uh, that you end up being embraced by the Nashville uh, crowd, uh, and yet your your background, the influences that you were talking about, really are sort of. Not, not really country, but kind of rootsy Americana rock, you know, and folk. You mentioned Harry Chapin in there. Mm -hmm. um, did it ever become a point when you were writing at some point where you were getting a little frustrated at what songs were really catching people's ears when you may have preferred? No, you got to listen to this song. I'm really proud of this one, but maybe they were gravitating towards ones that you thought, you know, I'd have better ones than that. Did that, was that something that is something you've ever had to deal with uh, at any time in uh, your career? No, I don't think so. And mainly because once you write the song and get it into shape and send it off, your part of it is done. I'm not really aware. I'm not the guy that's sitting playing the songs for people and seeing their reactions. And I get bored easily, so I try to always write a different kind of song. So I, there was never one type of song. I never chased it. I, if I if if I wrote a song that was that I wrote to be a ballad to pitch to Barry Manilow, and the Oak Ridge Boys recorded it, and I said, "Why are they recording it? That's not a country song." And they said, "Well, when they sing it, it's it's a country song," right. and that taught me that. You know, I always like to say I write I write the mannequin. They can put any clothes on the mannequin that they want. My song is just the mannequin. Mm -hmm. You know, dress them up in a sailor suit and you got a navy song. Dress right. them up, you know, in a clown suit and you got a, a song played on a calliope. It's not, you know, I, I I get bored easy, so I'm always trying, you know, gee, I wonder what it's I wonder how how it would be if I tried to write a you know, a song like uh, Steppenwolf. So right. I ne and I never chased it. If I had a hit with somebody, I never then said, oh, that's what they like. I'm going to concentrate on that kind of style because I know too much of what goes on in the business to know that they're too fickle in ADD to ever land on one thing. Interesting. So really, when you have a hit, you've moved on. The next song that you write could be something completely different stylistically or lyrically. You're not thinking in terms of, um, you know, what I just finished, uh, what I just sent out or what's on the charts now. You're always in the present when you're uh, when you're writing, I guess. Right. Other than some brief periods that were wonderful where, you know, the stars lined up and I was rocking it so hard that basically I would write a song on Monday and it would be recorded on Wednesday and be on the radio on Friday. During the 90s, I had a period that, that seemed like that. But for the most part, you write a song and it goes into the closet for years. You know, I've actually had cases where I've had to look up the title and go, I don't remember that song. Wow. <laughs> you know? that's, that's amazing. What Could you give us an example, uh, maybe off the top of your head, of a song that was recorded by more more than one artist where stylistically the song is done very differently, completely differently. Um, you know, can you think of a song that you wrote and was done by artist A and artist B, yet the arrangements were night and day different? I really can't, and I'll tell you why. The era that I came up through was just past the era when you could have a song recorded by multiple artists. The entire time I've been down here, I can only think of one song that's ever been recorded by anybody, two artists at the same time. And that was, uh, was it How Can I Live Without You? Where uh, Leanne Rhymes recorded it and Trisha Yearwood recorded it at the same time. But they were basically just, you know, different stops on the synth were the only difference between them. I had one song that was recorded by both Patty Loveless and George Jones. And there wasn't a lot of difference between them. It was just the artistic difference between yeah. one producer and the next producer. 
I've, I, you know, you mentioned that you mentioned that, and I've always found it interesting that in the '60s, like when it came to classic sound uh, songs written, um, say for Motown, you would have a song that was written that was actually would be recorded by two or three artists at around the same time. You might know the song as a Marvin Gaye song, but um, it had been recorded by somebody else like a month earlier. Yeah, I heard it through the uh, grapevine. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Gladys Knight and the Pips had it. Yeah, Gladys Knight and Marvin Gaye and uh, Creedence Clearwater, and I mean, you know, speaking as a professional songwriter, we all wish those days would come back because I would love to write a song that, as soon as one person does it, it's a dead song. Unless, unless you wait long enough. You know, if I wait long enough, somebody's going to do Love's Been again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I'll have to turn up my hearing aids when that happens. <laughs> what about collaborating, Gary? Um, I, I, you've done tons of songs you've written alone and and tons of songs where you collaborated with others. Um, was working with another, uh, another songwriter um, something that you welcomed or has there been instances where you would rather kind of be on your own with your own thoughts and not have input from outside or is that something that uh that you welcome and that actually uh is a better way for you to work it's not a better way for me to work i even now after all the collaborating that i do i still try to set aside uh a chunk of time to write by myself because I want to make sure I don't lose that internal editor. You know, I don't want to, when you're co-writing, you always have somebody there to go, is that good? And I want to still be able to just tell myself that that's good. Um, when I was writing up in Connecticut, before I moved to Nashville, I had three or four hits and all wrote by myself. But I wasn't unaware of collaboration. I mean, everybody I loved, whether it was Lennon McCartney or Gop and King, I was aware of songwriting teams, Lieber Stoller. I knew that that world was out there. And the before I moved to Nashville, the first person that my publisher hooked me up to write with was Vince Gill. And he and because he and I had both been in Pure Prairie League. Okay. I took his place. So they hooked us up to write. And I sat and I wrote a song and I think getting into the collaborating down here in Nashville accelerated my talents to a wild degree. Uh, it, it made me better at everything. You know, no matter who I wrote with, I learned something from. And, and it really, certainly my lyrics pre-collaboration and post-collaboration took big leaps forward. You know, I've always been a good melody guy, um, and I always try to steer the bus on melody. But lyrically, I was, you know, comparatively, I was a, I was a, a six, and was able to get up to about an eight and a half after writing with all the different people I got to write with and and see how they work and see how their brain puts the word puzzles together. Right, Alan, you you want to go up next? Sure. Um. I guess we sh I should um, steer into the Ringo uh, area now since we're sort of well into this. Um, and and how did how did that collaboration begin? How did you get involved with him in the first place? Uh, Mark Hudson, mm -hmm. who wrote "Living on the Edge" for Aerosmith and produced Ozzy and Aerosmith, he is a good friend of mine. He and I write for the, we, he and I at the time wrote for the same publishing company. Uh -huh. uh, and they put us together once to write. We barely knew each other, but we became friends over the years. And uh, Ringo had been sort of out of the business for a while and he decided to get back in and he was looking for somebody to collaborate, maybe produce him, help him write, help him, take the steps to get back into the, that world. And he had the same lawyer 
as Hudson. So when Ringo asked his lawyer, who is out there that can help me get started back into it again? He hooked them up. So that was Vertical Man. Mark wrote, you know, and, and, and wrote that album and produced that album. Great album. And uh, Mark Hudson had me come in and sing some harmonies. Never when Ringo was there. Hadn't met him. Just came out, sang some on that record. And, uh, you know, that was it. I was happy for my friend. I was thrilled. And then one day uh, the phone rings and it's Mark. And he said, uh, look, we're putting a band together to, to, to go out and promote the record. And we're going to go to England. We're going to shoot a video and then we're going to rehearse. And, uh, you know, we're going to come back and do a, a VH1 Storytellers. And uh, I want to know if you want to be in the band. Um, it's going to be, and then I, I don't remember the figure, but, but I'll just say it's, you know, with all that work, it's going to be $3,000. And I didn't miss a beat. And I just said, will Ringo take a check? <laughs> I'll pay $3,000 to play with Ringo. That's all. That's a deal. I'm in. He goes, no, no, no. He's going to pay. Uh, excuse me. He's going to pay me. Has he met me? So the next thing I know, I'm flying to England and uh, we, you know, rehearsed this great band with Simon Kirk on the drums and Joe Walsh and Jim Cox and, and uh, Jack Blades on the bass. And it was just amazing. And uh, that's when, you know, I, I first met him and, uh, I'll never forget like the first rehearsal right right off the bat where you know we had worked up we had done a lot of rehearsing before Ringo ever showed up Ringo comes on the first day we're on stage and we're playing probably photograph and Mark Hudson stops and goes Gary in, in this section here what are you singing I said well in the last line I'm singing the third harmony above and then the next line I am singing in unison with Ring. And Ringo walks up to the mic and goes, I've known him five minutes and I'm Ring. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I got pale. I thought I was going to get sent back. And it just, I ran to the bathroom. I was like sick going, oh my God, he hates me. And then Mark goes, no, no, you don't understand. He, you know, the more he likes you, the more crap he gives you. I said, I, I don't want him to like me too much because I can't take it. I'll get explosive <laughs> diarrhea. <laughs> so when did you start writing with him? I, I think that was probably around Ringo Rama. Yeah. So the next time they did the album, uh, I was lucky enough that uh, he invited me to come over to this little village over in England, about an hour and a half outside of London, where he had a studio and a house. And, uh, you know, a bunch of us, came out there and it was just heaven. It was, you know, every day we'd go into this village and have breakfast and then we'd come back and Ringo would be done working out and he'd come out and we'd write a song and then we'd go have dinner and then he'd come back and we'd record the song. And by the time we all went to bed, the song was done. It was recorded. It was a record. It was just a great time. Every day we did that just for weeks and weeks and weeks until the whole album was done. So, um, you know, a few of the things are just you and Mark and Ringo, but there, there are, are things that have as many as like five people, like uh, Ringo, Mark, you, Steve Dudas, and Dean Grakel, who I guess is his lawyer's son. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm used to writing by myself, or with like one, maybe two other collaborators. How do you do it with five collaborators? It's kind of, it, it just seems so unwieldy. It's not easy, but everybody quickly sort of found their purpose. You know, Steve is this unbelievable guitar player. Mm -hmm. So whenever we were, you know, going to go from point A to point B, on the guitar, he'd go, you know, if you go here, it'll sound cooler. And then we go, oh, my God, now the song sounds like, you know, we know how to play the guitar. 
And Dean is a great lyricist and he kind of had a backlog of, of song ideas you know, so some of those songs were lyrics that he had started that he hands in. And then we came up with the music and, and the rest of it. And, uh, you know, then it was, uh, you know, M Mark and I, who, uh, you know, mostly were responsible if it was a song that, you know, Ringo came in and said, I was on the treadmill and I have a, and a title came to me and I think it should be this kind of song. Then Mark and I took, you know, we, we, we hopped in the, the mutual driver's seat and we uh, turned it into a song. And, and whenever we hit a lyrical tough spot, we turned to Dean and whenever we needed a cooler chord progression, we turned to Steve. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would imagine the balance shifted within each of these songs where some you're more responsible for the melodic stuff, some maybe more input into the lyrics. Um, was, is, was that the case? Was it just sort of completely fluid whenever you sat down to write? It wasn't going to be, okay, I'm the melody guy. It was going to be just everybody contributing everything? No, not really. Once we got a song or two under our belts, we all recognize that you know that that uh we all recognize what our, our roles were and we turned to each other you know for what you know we we didn't turn to dean for melody and we didn't we didn't they didn't turn to me for cool chord progressions i i you know i i barely fumble my way around a g and a c so uh now we knew we knew we knew what what worked and 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 also Ringo is a great you know leader when he got to a point where we needed something he turned to the right person he wasn't going to turn to Dean and say what chord should we play here he would turn to Dudas or he would turn to me or Mark so you know he was always the boss so we always turned to him and go you know so you were principally the melody guy. I like to, well, I like to think so only because I know that in my history, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm ho hopefully and thankfully known as a, as a good melody guy. So I certainly, I'm sure I was obnoxious in trying to get it, you know, get each song to, to hit the notes that I heard in my head. Mm -hmm. so, you know, keeping in mind that we were working with, melodies that were going to be sung by Ringo, who right. is a much better singer than he thinks he is. Mm -hmm. He can sing higher than he wants you to know and stronger than he wants you to know, hmm. you know? Yeah, I was going to ask because, you know, you started out writing songs sort of, you know, without a particular performer in mind or maybe your own band or whatever, but that's one thing. And writing specifically for, okay, I know Ringo Starr is going to be singing this and his voice has certain characteristics and a certain range. And you'd have to think in, more in those terms. It's a different kind of writing, isn't it? You know, thankfully, no. That's yeah. something that I learned by being in Nashville in country music. A lot of times when I'm sitting to write a song, it's because I heard that so-and-so is looking for a song. Mm -hmm. And I'll go, I'm going to try to write that song for that slot on that record. And I'll go and I'll listen and I'll listen to Tim McGraw, if it's him. And I'll listen to where his register is and right. how high can he go and how low can he go. And does he like certain artists like to just sing a very, you know, linear, like, 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 like Lennon songs and certain singers, you have more free reign. So I was already um, totally comfortable with, with factoring in who I was pitching the song to, in which case we weren't even pitching. He was sitting right there. So I certainly wasn't going to say, well, maybe in this part you could go, La -da -dee -dee -dee, you know, and he's going to look at me like, <laughs> can you leave please have a yodel in there <laughs> yeah okay i should turn you back to ken well there's nothing that i that i find more fascinating at this part of ringo's career 
than his songwriting. And I know that certainly you've got those two songs in the Beatles with Don't Fast Be By and, and um, Octopus's Garden and the songs he wrote with Vinnie Poncia in the 70s, the few songs he wrote with, with George Harrison, um, some with Joe Walsh on Old Wave. But from Vertical Man on, he's actually co-written just about every single song on his albums. Right. So it was always my impression because very often I've heard Ringo say he's good at starting songs. He just needs help finishing them. And I remember when Why Not came out, he talked about the process of that where he came up with these backing tracks and he would get a collaborator and say, what can you do with this? So it just seems to me like there is no real set formula when it comes to writing with Ringo. It all depends upon who he's working with. And, you know, because if I'm thinking of you as the melody guy and certainly Mark Hudson's a great melodic writer, too. Um there must have been times when Ringo came up with perhaps the main idea of the song and you guys elaborated on what he did or how did, how exactly did that, did that work is, was it really, um, you said everybody had their role, but was there, was there a system and, and a formula in place or were there a lot of differences sometimes from songs to songs? There was a lot of differences. I mean, I've, I've done it in a lot of different ways. I've done it with that the way you were thinking where he would come up with a track and a loop and he would have a, a, a CD and there'd be eight tracks, you know, and grooves and, and drum parts and, and, and all this stuff. And he would say, okay, number one, three and five, I'm already writing with this guy, this guy, this guy, but the other ones are available. And I listen and I go, oh, I really, that's really fun. Mm. Let's do number six. That's really, I like that groove. I can think of something to do with that. And he'll go, okay. Uh, the I mean, it's so similar to every writing appointment that I have in Nashville. And then the paper comes out. Here's a bunch of song titles that I, that I want to write. Mm. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that one matches the music. Hold on a second. I don't know. That could be like the opening line of a chorus or, or and maybe even the end line of a chorus. Hold on. Uh, and he'll go, I like it. All right. All right. We got the opening and the closing line of the chorus. And now, just like I do here in Nashville, if I'm writing with anybody, Ringo, you're singing it. What do you? Th what is that title about? What do you think it's about? And then he'll say, it's about peace and love and we'll write it. <laughs> did you feel i know ringo's talked about choose love a lot as though it was a real band album i guess more so than ringo rama was or vertical man certainly on those albums you got a lot of outside musicians coming in guest starring on certain songs but choose love i mean you really were more involved than ever with the songwriting because you wrote 10 or co-wrote 10 of the 12 songs on there did it feel like a band to you a very absolutely you know if and it felt like the best band you could ever be in because when you walked once the song once the song started to coalesce and mm. it started to become a song you kind of just grabbed whatever instrument was near you which is why in some songs I'm playing bass and some songs I'm playing acoustic or electric or keyboards or whatever, whatever you felt we, none of us other than Ringo had a role that we had to play. We all just served the song and we had gotten really good at playing together by then. Mm. And Ringo, you know, once again, probably from those days of playing in Germany, we could record, you know, we could, we could try to get the track four times. And then, you know, Hudson would say, I don't think we're there yet. Can we do it one more time guy? And Ringo would go, let's go. And he'd go out. He never played the diva, like, excuse me, you got a drum track, you know, move it around in pro tools or whatever, but I'm done. I'm going to go in the house and have tea. He was sorry each time that the tracking was done. And he had to wait 
you know, to, to watch what else happens. But we really were a, a real comfortable band. And, you know, when, when we did a lot of, we did a lot of jamming and a lot of those, not a lot, but probably a couple of those songs started out as jams where we said, quick, 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 hit the red button. And then we'd go in and, 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 and say, let's turn that into a song. Hmm. Yeah. Um, are there any favorites from that time period? Certainly with Mark Hudson, because to me, I kind of look at it as a different period once he stopped working with Mark. Um, favorites of yours, and in particular, I got to say, because some of the ballads that came out of Ringo at that time, imagine me there, What Love Wants to Be, two of the best songs in Ringo's catalog, certainly for love songs. Um, love songs are concerned, but are there favorites of yours from that from that time period that you wrote or... Oh. Yeah, um, did I write uh, um, What Love Wants to Be, Just Him and Me? I think I kind of remember just sitting there knee to knee with him in his house writing that one. I, can look that. I know that like it's uh, Ringo, Mark Hudson, and you. Oh, okay. The credit on the record anyway. All right, I'm thinking of a different record. But, I mean, you nailed it with Imagine Me There. I mean, I still, I play that out myself. Yeah. And and uh people love it. I love it. I love this I love the experience of it and how unhappy I was with the recording of it at times. And you know, the the day that the the station wagon pulls up and it's Clapton driving and pulls an amp out of the back and walks in and sits down and plays the solo on it. And uh that was a song that I got to the studio early and I was sitting at the piano and I came up with the idea of that, of that, you know, uh, when the da 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 And I came up with it. And then when Ringo showed up, I, I took him aside and said, would you do something like this? And he loved it. And so that was the one we did that day. Um, I really love, uh, um, <clears throat> um, Memphis in yep. your mind. Yep. I love that one. Uh, I love the one that we wrote for Harry. Mm. You Harry. know, I got to do a whistle solo on it. Uh -huh. mm. um, boy, there's not many that I don't listen to and it brings back memories, but definitely imagine me there is if, if you, if you said, you know, show one song that shows us all firing at all syllables, that would be the one. Mm. I just want to say Missouri Loves Company. I can never get enough of that song. And See, now that was a full page of lyrics that Dean came and said, here, guys, what would you do with this? And it was that, you know, cl you know clever double entendre, right. uh, you know, and, and Ringo loved it. And uh, I don't think I was even on that song. I didn't I didn't write on that song. That song was recorded. I think that was a Vertical Man song. Was it? No, that's that's Ringo Rama. Okay, so it's Ringo Rama, but it was probably. <clears throat> I think I was part of the recording, but I don't know whether I wrote on it. I have to look at the credits. Okay. Yeah. But I loved it. Dean was a great lyricist. We just lost him last year. He passed away. Really? Hmm. No. From what? Um, not sure. Not sure. I, I don't want to say and be wrong. Good. I wasn't aware of it. I'm terrible. Yeah. All right. Um, one more song I want to bring up because I'll flash over to Darren. I'm sure there's some he wants to discuss with you. But I always thought Free Drinks was one of the most <laughs> coolest tracks because you play that to somebody else. You don't say who it is. They're not going to say it's Ringo. And uh, I know I, I'm pretty sure I brought this up to, to Mark Hudson, but there's a song that Blondie did called Atomic. And it's got sort of that same kind of feel to it. It's a dance track with a kind of a twangy guitar, Dwayne Eddy-ish kind of thing. Um, so that's what that kind of reminds me of. And Ringo's vocals are so distorted on it, I guess, intentionally. But what do you, what, 
What can you say about free drinks? Well, it's funny, you know, we listen to the the serious Beatle channel mm. and one day that song started and we were listening to it and my wife said, oh my God, I love this song. I've never heard it. It's really, really cool. And then she looked at me and said, did you write this? I went, yeah. And she got the biggest kick out of that. She had never heard it. And uh, I, I mean, that was just really complicated. I think that's the one with like the uh, the weird doo 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 things where we want it to sound like an Italian spy movie where the car is going down the mountain, you know, <laughs> you know, and and uh, you know, it's just it was just great that 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 Ringo would let all of our imaginations go crazy, and he never said. It was really rare when he would draw the line and go, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Hmm. He was up for he was up for just about anything. He was he was, uh, you know, and, and Hudson is always up for anything. So that was a dangerous combination. But I, I just remember that. I don't think any of us could believe what we were writing while we were writing it. it you know, you know, you always think, OK. We always have to work on songs that don't make the record, <laughs> but that but that one he loved it all the way through. Yeah. Were there a lot of leftover songs, or or even a few from those sessions? No, to tell you the truth, we were very systematic about it. You know, every time we finished a song, we put it up on the board, and we had decided how many songs we wanted, and um. Once we hit that and we were happy with all of them, you know, the thing is with that many great people, if a song isn't going well, we would just, we wouldn't belabor it. We would just move on and go, what else can we do today? Mm. Or, or, you know, go into London and have Indian food or something. So there weren't a lot of misfires. Um, I think there came a time when they put out like a, a, a an extras version of it. They kind of had to draw from a couple of things that maybe Mark did at his studio in LA to fill it out to find more because there weren't extra tracks that we didn't put on the record from the studio in England. Okay. Yeah, there was a deluxe edition of Ringo Rama with, uh, I think, three bonus tracks. And there's yes. a CD single that came out of the Vertical Man sessions with other stuff that wasn't on the album, but... Choose love, no, nothing bonus there. But uh, yeah, so yeah. we pretty much have everything. Yeah, there was one song where I remember he was playing lap slide, and I remember that was one of the bonus things that we we were just treating it like it was just us mucking about in the studio. But you know, we still finished it and put harmonies on it and stuff, and it ended up being one of the bonus tracks. I can't remember the title, but it was, uh, I just remember Ringo sitting there with a, a lap slide on his lap, huh. you know, tuned to a chord and, and you know, playing it like, uh, you know, like John played on George's song. Before You Blue. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Darren. All right. Um let's talk a little bit about Ringo, the songwriter um, from when you first started working um, with Ringo and, and Mark, uh, did you see a progression progression and an improvement in Ringo as a songwriter, as the albums passed uh, years passed and he was growing. Did you notice like a, he would grow more confident in putting material Whereas by the time, by the time Choose Love, he was perhaps making more significant contributions to songs as opposed to maybe five years earlier. Did did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly, it manifested itself in the amount of suggesting. One of the hardest things as a collaborator is one of the things you have to grow the toughest skin about is when you say, how about, and they say, no, mm -hmm. you know, that's really tough as a collaborator when you're brand new, because it can really shut you down. Mm 
So in the beginning, he was more the idea man. What do you want the song to be about? I won't say that. You know, how about this line? No, I don't say that. You know, I recently wrote a song for him that I really liked, and he really liked it. He said, Gary, I'm not cutting this. I said, why? You like it? He goes, I love it, but I wouldn't say it. So, you know, in the beginning, that's what he was comfortable doing. The longer he wrote, the more he got a tougher skin about it so that he would, how about a blah, 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 blah. And it would be great to write it down. Or how about blah, blah, blah. And you go, no, nah, we can do better than that. Um, and once he got that tougher skin, it was, okay. And then it would be something else. So there was a lot more output from him and a lot more courageous how abouts. Mm -hmm. When in the beginning, he was really not comfortable doing a lot of how abouts. Mm -hmm. Any any songs you could think of where he came into the session with a song largely written on his own? He may have had a burst of, um, you know, when writing a song, a burst of creativity where he came in with one that was close to being finished. No, I don't think so. He really, I, I don't think he likes the. I don't think he. I don't know if he likes or not, but I never had that experience. He would come in and there would be a verse he'd have four lines you know and we'd go great i would change one word and he'd go oh yeah that's better um but that's as far as he ever that's as far as he ever walked in the door having it mm -hmm. having a chunk you know right. which is good for me as a co-writer the more song that's already written the least fun I have working on it. I got you. You know, when when somebody's already done all the fun parts, it's like you already put the Lego kit together. All you want me to do is put the flag on the top. That kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um we were talking about uh the bed the bed you guys called yourselves the roundheads and uh, what a strong unit you are as a band. Uh, as a fan, um every so often there would be like you know amongst Ringo heads and Beatle heads it would be great if Ringo put the All Star Band concept aside and toured with the Roundheads. Now that would have meant, of course, Ringo probably would have had to carry. You know, Ringo would have had to carry almost, if not an entire show, as the main guy up front. Whereas the All Star Band allowed him to be a guy, the drummer in the band for a while, and just kind of blend in. Was there any any talk about possibly doing, even if it were a small tour, a Roundheads tour where it was Ringo and the Roundheads? Amongst the Roundheads? Constantly. We were screaming inside to have that happen. <clears throat> Ringo, as far as I know, never even, never once entertained it. I just don't think he... Yeah, it was that being out there and carrying it for a whole night. It's not like he wouldn't have brought another drummer to drum and he could have been out front. Um, it, that would just, I, I don't know why, you know, that would be a lot of work. But anytime to this day, you get more than one roundhead in a room together and it's all we talk about. Yeah. Why didn't we ever boom, 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 boom. Those, those few times that we got to play, you know, like on a TV show or at the bottom line or the Wilburn out in L.A., you would just listen to how tight we were and how well worked out the songs were and how good we sounded. And it just, it will always be a lost opportunity for all of us. Mm -hmm. Can I interject? Okay. Yes, Sam. Um, one of those records, either Ringo Rama or Choose Love, I reviewed in the Times and I said, this is a really good band. He should tour with these guys and put the all-star thing on hold for a bit. And um, it was that review came out like right around the time of one of those bottom line concerts. And David Fishoff came up to me before 
the concert started and he said, so I read that line to Ringo about how he should tour with the Roundheads. And he said, I'll tell him to forget it. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess he didn't really entertain it, but he did hear about it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to think that it's any kind of worry about whether we were good enough to do it. I just think it's a lot of work for him. It was and something, something he never did either. And he's never done it. He's yeah. never done it in uh, an entire, the song, uh, the VH1 um, unplugged thing was right. probably the longest concert he ever did, you know, on, on his own. The two that, he has those two live, non-All-Star Band live albums, which you were part of. Uh, I know you were part of VH1 Storytellers, that live record. Uh, and, and live at Soundstage, which he did. Yeah, yeah, in uh, Chicago. The few shows he did to promote Choose Love turned out to be the Soundstage live album. And I was, I was like in another galaxy. I was so stoked to see you guys at the bottom line in '98, um, and then at Irving Plaza. Yeah, uh, that's what it was, Irving, Irving Plaza. It was like one of the only shows. A few, I think you did one out in California, if I remember correctly. And they and they uh, soundstage took, I guess, what they needed for the television show, and it became the live album. And I remember the Irving Plaza show was a Sunday night, and after the show, we were like, these guys should tour. Because, you know, it was a different vibe, but then you realized that would mean Ringo would have to do something that might take him too far out of his comfort zone and force him to do it for a month, if not more, at a clip. And that was come out front. Um, another quality of the Roundheads in the studio, which I always thought was probably mostly um, uh, driven by Mark, but could very well have been um, a kind of a democratic uh, suggestion, is once Ringo and Mark and the Roundhead started working together, there was a very, very heavy Beatlish feel to Ringo's solo music, which hadn't been there before. You got a taste of it on Time Takes Time. You know, and I've always been amazed that as good as the Time Takes Time album is, if you really look into that album, that was pieced together for different sessions, different producers. I mean, maybe Ringo was trying to feel, you know, who he felt comfortable working with. Mark makes a very brief appearance on Time Takes Time. But then it was with starting with, with Vertical Man, uh, where oh, these sounded like lost Beatles songs. Um, and it worked perfectly. I mean... If there ever was an instance where an artist was intentionally embracing a sound that he had a chance that he had the opportunity to had a hand at creating many, many years later, it was the sound that Ringo's record starting with Vertical Man had. Was there. I mean, I don't I'm trying to think of a good way of putting it. Was there a point in the studio where it was like. Let's make it Beatlish, or it just came naturally. Well, it came naturally only because I tend to write Beatley songs. I tend to produce songs, always thinking, you know, what would George Martin do? Hudson, no matter who he's recording, he's always trying to to make Sergeant Pepper. And this was his golden opportunity yeah. to make Sgt. Pepper with an actual Beatle. And I think other producers, I don't want to speak for them, but sometimes I wonder if they were afraid to take it over the line. And Hudson wasn't. Hudson basically, we would come up with something and we would turn to him and we, and we would even go, oh, that's Beatley. That's is that, and we turned her and we in the beginning we turned to Ringo and go, Ringo, is that too beatly? And the first time we did that, he looked at us and went, It's okay, I am one. Yeah, you know, it, basically, we went into the philosophy of if there's anybody that has a right to sound beatly, it's a beetle. So once, once we 
once we got the green light for that, um, probably went a little overboard with it, mm-hmm. but you know, it was a fun, it was fun to have the handcuffs off. And every time, you know, if it wasn't Ringo and we were writing the song with somebody else, we still would have done the harmonies like that because we learned how to sing harmonies by listening to Beatles songs. So Mark and I can't help but sing, ooh, sha la la, ooh, sha la, we can't help it. And right. it was nice to not have to think of different ways to sing and not what we wanted to sing because we were worried that Ringo was going to think it's too beatle So we went crazy. And that never happened that Ringo said, no, no, that, that one too much. Back off with the well, not never, uh-huh. not never. I can think of a couple of times. I can't think of specifically, but I could think of a couple of things that didn't survive the final mix because he just thought, you know, you already got three beetly things going all at the same time. You don't need that fourth one, you know. Right. Right. Well, I tell you, you don't. Um... You in my for my own my own opinion, it's just sometimes you don't appreciate what you have, and then when you don't have it, you really miss it. And as much as I love the records of Ringo's continued to make, there was a certain uh there was a certain magic, a little picture Mark Hudson Pixie Dust missing from the records that he did post Mark. Uh still solid, very good records. I like everything Ringo's done just about. Uh, from that but there was a certain i from having you know met him many many times through the years there was a certain um kind of like rainbow <laughs> flare to the to the music that suddenly wasn't there anymore or at least it was it was tampered down um are you at liberty are you comfortable talking about what went happened there with the relationship between Ringo and Mark, because that, at least this fan here, was extremely surprised when we learned that the relationship not only ended, but ended abruptly. And and you thought this was going to go on forever because it seemed like a perfect union. Kindred souls had met, you know, and were really bringing out the best. And, and, and I think Ringo was bringing great stuff out of Mark. At the yeah. same time. Yeah. I really wish, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like there's some sinister causation to all this. It was a whole bunch of little things that just happened that it was maybe just time to go in a different direction. And, you know, even Ringo kind of says, you know, that that was that was a period of time, you know, that we were working together. And now I'm in a period of time that we're not working together, you know, and and uh, it wasn't like one, you know, giant thing, like he took the last cinnamon roll or something like that. It was uh, I really can't. Um, you know, it was a whole lot of little things that. I was there to watch, but I'm not, I can't really turn it into a story. Mm-hmm. Right, and you kind of were on the periphery watching this kind of develop in front of your eyes, but not. Yeah. I mean, you could see it. You could see it happening while we were working. And uh, so when it did, um, you know, I don't want to say blow up because it makes it sound much more, you know, uh, much more explosive than I mean it to. But when, you know, when that wound down, um, it was more of a, you know, okay, we got, you know, three or four great albums out of it and all those songs. And and none of us will ever not be disappointed that we're not still doing those records and still being, you know, his recording band. But you know, nobody keeps, you know, unless you're in McCartney's band for 40 years, nobody keeps the gigs forever. Mm -hmm. And and we're talking Liverpool 8 was the album. I think, I I guess you'd started getting songs together for Liverpool 8. And then it just seemed like that was the transitional album. Yeah, right up until the point where where it was mixing. Mark went off and uh, I believe uh, Dave 
um, Dave Stewart, yeah. Dave Stewart ended up mixing the record. Uh, you know, we pretty much did that whole record. That was a that was a toughie for me. I was sick as a dog during that whole recording process. But you know, proud of the record. It had some really cool things on it, and very unsatisfying the way it ended because it got taken out of his hands. And when you listen to the record, you know, I think it doesn't match what we left every night hearing in our heads. Yeah. You know, what we had for rough mixes and things like that. Um, you know, I'm not in a position to say better or worse, but just really, um, it was definitely different. And he definitely tried to turn it into what he thought it should sound like, which is a producer's job. Right. Yeah. And it was definitely on, you know, immediately upon listening to the album, you heard it was, it was just, just, just disjointed quality to it. Something was not right here. So, you know, yeah, yeah. happening out of place or, oh, and therefore, oh, well, I hear, nope, that's gone. You know, that was kind of, that was an album that was solid, but was all over the map and didn't, I mean, Ringo Rama and Choose Love, I think of the two that, you could make the argument can be held up to, I mean, all, most Ringo fans will look at the third album, Ringo, and that's the one. And it is the one, but uh, Ringo, uh, Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and Choose Love, in my book, you could make the argument were, from beginning to end, maybe more, more cohesive and solid records, um, where Ringo was part of a band again, which we've been talking about. Right, yeah. I think each of those albums was, you know, the... the we had, I think we hit three triples in a row, and it was a shame to have the last one be a bloop double. But I tell you the truth, that's not the getting the three, the three triples is hard, and you accomplish something, and it's not something that happens. And you can't, and, and the more you try to make something like that happen, it, the harder it is to get the end result that you want. Absolutely. You know, the more you push it. Really, really proud of it. Those, they don't sound as good as they are by accident. You know. Right. Right. Mark Hudson is really one of the most brilliant producers I've ever been in a studio working with. He's like, you know, he's like, uh, you know, Brian Wilson. He's, you know, when, when you're laying something down, he knows what the next 12 things are and how they're all going to work with each other. And, and I came away from all of this thinking like, I wish Mark made more of his own music. Okay. He's got things out there, but I mean, the, just so much more I hear unless it's a not to speak for him. Maybe he's not comfortable being, you know, putting more cuts and albums out once a year or whatever, but um, you know, really grew an appreciation for what his talents uh, have. And speaking of having a lot of talent, uh, let's throw it over to Alan for some more questions. Like the way I did that, Alan. Nice there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I probably only have one more Ringo related question, which is the, the the other thing that I don't understand about his career, apart from why he didn't tour with the Roundheads. And I and I guess I guess the having to sing all night thing must have been the significant part of it. But the other thing is, you know, you you do these albums, you work really hard on all of these songs. And then he would go out with the All Stars and play maybe one or two new songs from the album. I, I never understood that. And as a songwriter, I would think you probably don't understand it either, because if he was out there singing these songs, it, it could only it could only help sell the albums. It could only help make the stuff better known. And you know, it's almost as if he's saying, "Well, you know, but I want to go out and sing the well known stuff. But how is it going to get well known?" You know, is it just that he's in a different stage of his career than people who think that way would be? You know, people who who think that way are, are probably starting more than than they are where he is. But still, well, it's kind of you know, there's two tiers to that. You know, what one is Ringo loves creating, he loves recording, he loves the whole everything about making a record. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like promoting. He doesn't like talk shows he doesn't like 
going and saying, hey, I've got a new record out. So, you know, we'd spend a year and a half making a record and he'd go for two weeks to a few a few TV shows and that was it. And we'd go, okay, let's wait for the next record. And uh, as far as the live shows, I mean, that's like, an, you know, that's sort of like a, a tropism of the industry. As much as you want him to sing, you know, and he did sing Memphis in mm-hmm. my mind for a while, mm-hmm. but it, it always ends up being the song that people go out and get popcorn or, or pee to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, with a, with a catalog as, as, as extensive as his, would you rather have them stay in the seats and clap along to what goes on? Or you, do you have to try to force feed them, you know, Memphis in my mind? I think he just got tired of force feeding. And, and sometimes you just take the, the easiest, the, the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't think he really tried to do it much though, you know, apart from those couple of roundhead gigs um, you know, where, where that stuff got played a bit more. Um, and those were, were great gigs. I was at two bottom line ones and, um, they really had a great feel. I mean, I like the all-star band things too, but, but those were special, those performances. And, um, anyway, so what are you, um, what are you working on now? What are you, what have you been writing lately and for whom? Um, writing, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with this organization where I go out and I write with, uh, members of the armed services or first responders that have any sort of issues, PTSD, whatever. And, and they use songwriting as, as therapy. Mm Mm-hmm. Great. So we go and we can sit in a room with eight, you know, people that are either soldiers or EMTs or cops or whatever. And we talk. And at the end of a few hours, we have a song that we've written and it helps them process. So I go out and we do that. Uh, um, been working a lot with us, a, a band, a young band called the Accidentals. Mm-hmm. And my wife and I are actually going to go out on tour with them in March. We're going to go out and do like a, a two and a half week tour uh, with the Accidentals. And they play violin and cello. And it's going to be really fun to put that on our songs. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, other than that, you know, writing songs and then scratching my head going, you know, who can I who can I send this to? Mm-hmm. You know, Um yeah, just tr- just trying to just trying to stay busy. I actually, uh, you know, I actually wrote a Beatle book that I'm trying to get published. Hmm. So um, that's how I spent my pandemic. <laughs> you know? What is the what's the tenor of the Beatles book? It's a fiction. It's a novel. It's it's ah. uh, what would have happened if if uh, if that kid never did fly over from Hawaii and John stayed alive and they ended up after Linda's death uh, putting together, finally getting back together for a benefit concert. Wow, that's a great idea. How hard would that be? How how do they even tell the world? You know, Walter Cronkite's not here. How do you uh, how do you even rehearse? What songs do you do? Do they remember any of them? Are you <laughs> going to do My Sweet Lord? That's not a Beatles song. How do you get George to be willing to play help again? Right. You know, yeah. it's it's a really fun book. Just trying to find a publisher that's not scared off by, you know, by the fact that they're both still alive. So do you um, do you have them get together and have a set list? And is Memphis on my mind on it? <laughs> no, no, nothing but Beatles songs. It's a lot of fun. Watch. It's a lot of fun reading about how the rehearsals go. OK, look forward to that. Might we hear more from uh, Blue Sky Riders at some point? I don't know. I don't think so. That kind of ran its course for Kenny. Uh, you know, Kenny is out there just doing the occasional uh, the occasional casino or corporate gig these days. 
you know, we did do two albums that I'm really, really proud of. George and I play those songs all the time for people. We got a big fan base for that band. Um, you know, once again, I, I've had the wonderful luxury of working with some real geniuses and, uh, and I'm sure Kenny feels the same way about me. No, I'm no, Kenny is a real, Kenny is a real genius. And it was a real pleasure to uh, work with him and George and I learned a lot and uh, love the songs we did. Any songwriters, new songwriters, newish artists that you really uh, have uh, taken a liking to? Anything you've been hearing uh, on the radio or whatever? Um, you know, there's a you know, country music right now is uh, in a little bit of a phase that you know, that is sort of off the mark for me. I'm not their target audience right now. Um, so I don't tune into it a lot. I pretty much stick to listening to, you know, other stations than that. But there's a few songs out there that I've heard recently that I really like, and I looked up who wrote them and, you know, might track them down. I can remember when I came to town and, uh, you know, sought out writing with Harlan Howard, you know, who was in his 70s. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, you know, those those young people that are writing songs that I find interesting might be interested in, you know, getting together with a, a geezer. <laughs> and do you ever make it up back up to uh, the Northeast? Do you have any roots still in Connecticut, um, family, whatnot? Well... Hudson and I, with our friend Mark Miranda, put together a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young tribute band called Laurel Canyon. Oh, that's and right. Yeah. We play a lot, and it's really, really fun. Just three acoustic guitars. And we're actually playing the Kate. Um, we're playing the Kate on the 27th of this month. So I'm coming up and going to hit my hometown and have a steamed cheeseburger and, and, and play the Kate and then play a theater in Natick, Massachusetts. So I try to, you know, I, I know I come to Meriden maybe three times a year. I'll be playing later in the summer where uh, uh, Laurel Canyon is actually playing in my hometown at the at the park in the band shell. Um, I think it's in September or something. So mm -hmm. that'll be really fun. But I love going back up to my hometown. Love everything about it. Don't really have much family there anymore other than maybe cousins. But um you know, still have the friends that I went to high school with. Hmm. They got to rename Main Street after Gary Burr Street, at least part of Main Street. They rename it after you. Well, with any luck, it'll be where the good steamed cheeseburger place is. And, <laughs> and maybe it'll get me a deal. I'm going broke buying that stuff. <laughs> I tell you, Meriden is, is like uh, 20 minutes from where I live. So I'm going to have to catch that show. In September, yeah, uh, please do. And the one at the Kate, I love that theater. I've been there many times. I'll tell you, we're really happy. Uh, th there's only four tickets left at the Kate. That'll uh, be our first sellout ever. Okay, well, right after this interview, I guess I'll have to go buy tickets. There you go. I just wanted to ask you just a couple more Ringo questions, if you don't mind. I do um, not mind. You were there to witness since you were on Ringo Rama. Um, the recording of Never Without You, um, that being the George Harrison tribute. What was that like for Ringo to go through recording that along with everybody else in the room? Was it very emotional? Was it very cathartic? What did you feel when that was recorded? Yeah, it was it was emotional. Um, it really led to a lot of George stories, you know, which is... That's what I love about Ringo. He is he is not he doesn't seem to be tired of telling the stories. And he always seems to have a new one. So that really came that really brought out a whole bunch of of George stories and um it was really sweet that you know right up till doing the vocal he was inserting 
lines at the end of the choruses that that were different than how they wrote it originally and they were more about George. I want to sing this because this is this is for George. And I want to I, sing, I want to sing this line because George will get mm. it. It was really it was really it was really something. I've heard Ringo say that when he first started writing the song, originally it was going to be for Harry Nilsson. And then he said, well, how about for John as well? <laughs> and then it became one for George. Were you there to witness the whole evolution of that? Did you ever hear him work on the song in the very beginning when maybe it was about Harry or or John? No, no. Um, I, I wasn't. I came in after mm. when it was pretty much formed. And I, I heard that too, but I never saw any evidence of it. You mm. know, it was, uh, however they retailed it to be about George, they did a seamless job because I can't hear that song and not think that it's a hundred percent tribute to his friend. Oh yeah. Hey, the song titles that are mentioned, it's, it's so perfect. They flow so well in the song. So, um, yeah. And that's I, Gary Nicholson. He wrote that with Gary Nicholson here, you know, uh, another Nashville writer. He's done, a, he's done a lot of writing with Ringo. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. got inducted into the Hall of Fame last year. Songwriter Hall of Fame. Very good. I just want it's to not know. Bad when you think he's had BB King cuts and Ringo cuts. That's <laughs> about as yin and yang as you can get. Boy, that's two different worlds. Yep. Um, since you've been there, continuing to work with Ringo, there'd always be a song that you wrote with Ringo on certain albums, songs like Touch and Go, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you compare what it was like to be with the Roundheads and then this other atmosphere where Ringo has all these different songwriters? You know, it's like, uh, there's so much that I love about the Roundheads period and post that. You know, the, when you're working with different writers like uh, um, Van Dyke Parks and Richard Marks and Dave Stewart and Todd Rundgren and all these different people, it's going to it's going to show in the music, the styles of, of those songwriters as well. So I hear a lot more variety in some ways in the post Roundheads music, but at the same time. In the days with Mark and, and the Roundheads, there, there was more cohesion. I think, on those albums, where the songs, like every song was solid to me. I mean, I'm I'm very much a song man. The song always comes first. And right. I love the songs, first of all, on those albums and what you guys brought to them. But then it's it's a different experience to me after that from Why Not On. So how do you look at, you know, one that one period of Ringo and then what followed? Well, it's a different experience for me, too, because back then we knew we had a large palette. Whatever you did for the first one, you're going to be doing something different on the next one and then the next one and the next one. Uh, these days, you know, we're all competitive and you're all and you're aware that you're aware that you're writing a song to try to make a CD to try to get on an EP where the other writers are Diane Warren and Richard Marks and Van Dyke and people like that. So, you know, you worry a little more and you, you know, there's that constant sense of, is this, how does this shape up? I haven't heard the other songs. So how does this song shape up? Hmm. And I, I have always gone in on it that, I'm the melodic country rock guy. So I figure that's my lane. I'm not going to out Diane, Diane Warren. I'm not going to out romantic ballad, Richard Marks. So I figure my lane is to like touch and go to just have it be, you know, a, a ding, 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 you know, a, 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 you won't see me kind of a thing. I'm always, I'm always figuring I'm going to be good for that track. And mm -hmm. then you just cross your fingers that when he records it is a time when, you know, Joe Walsh or Lukather is in town. So you get cool people playing on it that you can brag about, you know? Mm. 
and I would imagine it's a different experience. Like with the Roundheads, you were all in the studio together. Whereas now a lot of what Ringo does is people sending him tracks that he mixes in digitally. Well, when he and I write, we write in the room next to each other. I've got a guitar. We've got papers. We've got pencil. Mm. We get it. We tweak it. We work on it until we get it right. And then we walk back to the studio where his engineer is. And I sit down and I play the guitar track. Right. And I sing the scratch vocal. And then he goes, get out. And he throws me out of the house and I go back to the hotel. And that's what he builds the whole song around. He brings in the other guitar players. He'll bring in Ben Montent. He'll bring in, and the next thing it gets bigger and bigger. And then he replaces my vocal with him. Mm -hmm. And if we're lucky enough, he'll have Georgia and me come out and sing harmonies on the song, which is fun. And maybe on another song or two while we're there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's it. I, I, I write the song with him. I, you know, and he's in, you know, he's in there while I'm playing the guitar, he's playing the drums. So mm. we're doing it four or five times to get it right. And, and uh, I'm telling him where to put all the drum fills and how to do it. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Like I'm going to tell Ringo, you know, but uh, actually, you know, what I like is Ringo likes playing on songs for other people. So when, the last few years, when George and I have had the chance, we've written songs yeah. that we've sent out or gone out there and had him play drums on. And one of the times he just wasn't playing what Georgia thought it should be. And Georgia wasn't shy about telling him, you know, no, it really should. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and later he said, I would have been harder on you when you were singing harmonies. I didn't know you were going to be so hard on me. I should have really... I should have really tortured you when you were singing harmonies. <laughs> Did she call it? Yeah, which, <laughs> there is a song that Ringo drums on for you when Ringo joined the band. Yeah. Tell us about that song. Well, it was uh, it was that uh, Ron Howard documentary. Hmm. And they talked about how they were like a rocket ship on the pad, but they couldn't take off. And when Ringo joined the band, it was like he was the rocket fuel and then they could take off. Mm -hmm. And Georgia came home and said, that's a song. We got to figure out some way that says, you know, that says everything about that of wherever you are, you just need that one special person. And it's like when Ringo joined the band, it, 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 it blasts you off into space. So we, uh, we, it was really funny because Ringo offered, we asked him to play on one of our, on a song because we were making a new album. And mm -hmm. he said, sure. And uh, then we suddenly realized we didn't have a song. So we had to write that one, uh, you know, before we went out to LA to bring it to him to play. And the funny thing is he never really listened to the words while he was playing the drum part. And then afterwards he called me and said, I didn't know it was about me. I would have put in more fills when I when right when you said when Ringo joined the band, I should have done a big drum fill, but I wasn't listening. I was just trying to 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 figure out all the parts. And that I thought that was really, really funny. But we love having him on that track. You would have let him redo it. Yeah. You know what? We're happy with what we got. We're, you know, with 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 in that world, the key phrase is don't push your luck. <laughs> now something that i just learned from chris Engelhart's book beatles fully uncovered for ringo's 70th birthday the videographer brent carpenter made a video rewriting the song ringo the lauren green song and made a video and i guess ringo's in it and paul mccartney's in it george martin mick fleetwood and alice cooper Where's this video? <laughs> I think we don't. Yeah, have... Brent, Brent and I wrote that song. Okay. And we went all over the world filming people. And I'll never forget, we went and we shot Paul McCartney singing this line about how when they made the switch of the drummers, and Paul's line was, and from that point on, Star was best. And I just remember we were in his office and we were getting set up to have him record. 
and Paul had the whole lyric on his table, on his desk, and he was reading it. And he read the whole lyric, and he looked up at me, and he said, did you write this? I said, yeah, we wrote this. And he went. <laughs> and it was like the greatest compliment as a songwriter I ever had. Paul went. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so we went and, and then, you know, we, we were down in the lobby getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, George Martin walked by and we went, would you uh, do a line? And he went, sure. So we shot him doing a line. And uh, Charlie Watts, you know, all these people, they're all singing one line of this long, long song about Ringo, the 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 gunslinger, the drum slinger. What became of that video? Yeah. Well, we played it on his birthday. And uh, I mean, Brent's got a copy. I got a copy. I don't know. I don't know why it's not out there, but I was going to call Brent in a little while anyway. And I'll ask him, what, I guess because it was our gift to him on his 70th birthday, yeah. that it's kind of his to decide what to do with. Hmm. You know, I don't know that it would be really kosher for us to suddenly put it out on a website or something, but it's, I mean, a lot of the people that are in it aren't here anymore. And it's really cool to see it. Uh, did you say Ringo is in it? No, no, it's two Ringo. Okay. Barbara's in it, Marjorie, Joe, Chris Christopherson. Um, just just about everybody you can think of. It's 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 a great three and a half minute tribute to him. Wow. Nice. Well, we'd love to see it. Yeah. Um, I want to bring up one thing because, you know, we've all lost a lot of great people in the entertainment field. And la last year, one of our biggest losses for me was Olivia Newton-John. And I know that you got to produce an album for her in 1998 called Back With a Heart. What was it like working with her? It was... It was wonderful it was easy we met when we both were at a songwriter retreat in france at a castle miles copeland's castle and we were out there and and we met and we we wrote together and we really liked each other and we had a really good time and and then she uh um you know called me up and said she was coming to nashville to write and so she came and we wrote like I think three songs maybe and she was nice enough to go I'm gonna make a record why don't you produce these why don't you produce our songs and she didn't have to ask me twice we had a great time it was fun she uh you know she came to, to Bluebird at one of my shows and I have I, I always remember I had a really sore back and I have pictures of me lying on the floor while Olivia is walking on my back and her bare feet to try to make my back ache go away. So that's something I'll I'll never not wonder at. And uh, you know what? She was just so sweet and so nice and so easy that you had to remind her. You had to remind yourself. You know, one of those things. You had to remind yourself, or or, or you got reminded when you'd go out to lunch or dinner or something and everybody went crazy that you're sitting you know with olivia newton john you go oh yeah you're her you know couldn't have been nicer and and uh you know we still every time she came to town we 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 saw her and and uh you know constant contact with emails and stuff and you know just absolutely heartbreaking when that happened you know you just she just beat it back so many times. You just thought she always would because she was just too good, you know? Yeah. So it kind of shocked you when she lost the fight. I met her briefly because there was a, a songwriter showcase in Connecticut and, and, and Mark Hudson was one of the songwriters and she was in the audience. And I just came up to her after the show and she couldn't have been nicer and more down to earth. Just like the girl next door, you know. Yep, exactly what you wanted her to be. Mm. All right, one last thing. An, an, another of my heroes that you work with was Carol King. 
How did you get to tour with her? Same thing. The castle in France. Yeah. She was there. And so was Ted Nugent. And you've never lived until you sat around a fire while T Ted Nugent and Carol King argued politics. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. You know, it was just fun. And uh, we wrote a song together and hung out for like a week or two and just got along really, really well. And and we uh, continued writing songs. And then I was really, I mean, I can't believe the luck of it, of, of just, uh, she wasn't touring, but she was doing political things where she would just show up with her and her guitar player, Rudy Guest. And they would just do the two of them. And she said, I love that feel because it's like I'm in their living room playing. And she said, if you want me to go out and tour, because her manager did, if you want me to go out and tour, I'll do it. But I want to do it like a living room, just like that, me and Rudy. And then she thought about it for a while. And then she came back and said, I want one more person, one more guitar that can switch off on guitar bass and sing the third harmony. But it's got to be Gary Bird. If it's not him, I ain't doing it. Wow. Nice. So they, they called me up and kind of like with the Ringo thing. Would you like to go and tour the world with Carol? And I said, why not? I know all the songs. Mm -hmm. Not going to be a hard learning curve. And, uh, you know, every night. And she was so nice. She even let me sing the James Taylor verse on, on You've Got a Friend. You know, and and she was just she even did a segment in each show where I got to sing two of my songs. It was like she was introducing me to this crazy, wild audience of the biggest number of people I've ever played to. Mm. And we, you know, we traveled the world and it was, you know, she was fabulous. I just remember a sound check at Red Rocks and it was a little cold and misty. And we're standing in the wings waiting to go out to sound check. And she goes, that's what you're wearing for sound check? It's cold out there. I said, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, you need a sweater. Hold on. And she went back, got a sweater, came back out, gave it to me. And then, okay, come on. Now we'll do sound check. <laughs> that's great. What a that's sweetheart. Great. You know, what yeah, a compliment just, to, to pick you, you know. I mean, someone was, like it, Yeah, it, it was, it was wonderful. We got to sing a big duet together and... Uh, it was great. She's doing well. Just talked to her a couple of days ago. Oh, great. So do you have anything? Uh, do you want to tell us about shows coming up, tours, album releases, songs coming out? Anything that you got going on that you want, uh, you want uh, the folks watching to know about? Well, we got well the you, uh, about. you know what? My, my, my wife, Georgia Middleman, award-winning songwriter, singer in her own in her own uh, vision. And and uh, she and I do an internet show on the Middleman Burr Facebook page. And we do it every Wednesday at 8.30 at night and every Sunday at two in the afternoon. You just go to the Middleman Burr Facebook page at either of those times. And we've done it since the beginning of the pandemic. We're going on to three years doing it twice a week. And we've got this wonderful loyal audience and we do our hits or or we do requests that people they know our catalog better than us and just all these songs that we've written we've written a lot of songs by our you know together and uh you know we just goof around and make fools of ourselves and sing in the in husband wife harmony for an hour twice a week that's so great. that's a lot of fun people can tune in for that Keep your eyes open for uh, Laurel Canyon because uh, we're really, really tight. And, uh, you know, just still hoping to write the next big, uh, big hit that's going to change the world. Hmm. Sounds good. Gary, this has been wonderful. We thank you so much for the time you spent with us. Anytime you want to come back, you know, you are family here. The Zoom is open. The Zoom, Zoom is open. open. Always <laughs> open for you. Thank you. Really see. great, guys. Really good. Good research. Good questions. Thank you. I really enjoyed myself. Okay. Thank you, Gary. All right. Talk All right. to you soon. Yeah. Peace.
Well, that was fantastic. You couldn't have asked for a better near two hours to spend with Gary Burr. And he's got quite a story to tell. There should be a documentary made on his career. Hmm. Ken Burns, you listening? <laughs> All right. So let's just tell folks what we have in store very quickly. Um, Darren, let's start with you. All right. Um, you can catch me on WFEV Radio. We're in New York City, 90.7 FM, uh, and I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights, um, starting at 10 p.m. each night till 2 a.m., and then Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4 in the afternoon. That's 90.7 FM in the New York City metropolitan area, uh, and you can listen anywhere, even if you're not around New York, on our website, WFEV.org, and we have an app, which you can download and listen to us there and uh and look for me on facebook i've got two facebook pages and um you know join me on one of them and i'll invite you to the other okay great alan okay you can find me on facebook either under alan cozen or alan cozen remix um, you can write to all of us, and if you have show ideas or things you are interested in us looking into, um, feel free to write. Uh, the email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter feed um, at things we said fab. And um, we also have two Facebook pages, things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and just things we said today all over the place all right uh as for me ken michaels a few things on my youtube channel ken michaels radio i just did an interview with don daneman don was a member and is still a member of the band the american band called the circle and back in 1966 you'll recall they had a couple of hit records red rubber ball turn turn down day they also toured with the beatles on their U.S. tour of 1966. They have a brand new CD out, and it's called <laughs> Center of the World. They actually um, do new versions of Red Rubber Ball and Turn Down Day, and they even have a song on there, which is all about their experience of being with the Beatles in 1966. We Were There, really great song. And a whole bunch of other new songs from them that are really good. And uh, next week, I'll be giving you folks the chance to win a copy of the new CD from The Circle on my website. So again, uh, the YouTube channel is Ken Michaels Radio. More interviews to come. The other uh, talk show podcast that I co-host, Talk More Talk. We just did a show on Lost Lennon songs. Songs that were not released by John Lennon while he was alive. Uh, all of which, most of which, we heard during the Lost Lennon Tapes uh, radio series. Our next show will be next Monday, January 23rd, where we'll be discussing for each Beatle in his solo career what we feel is the most underrated album from each of the four of them. Don't forget that you can listen to my syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing, on demand at WFDU's website at WFDU.FM. And on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, you can win copies of the latest big Beatle books, like The McCartney Legacy, like Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium, 1965, Chris Engelhardt's Beatles Fully Uncovered. They all could be won on my website. All right. Thanks so much for listening and watching. And thanks so much to Gary Burr for being such a sensational guest. And... Uh, this is Things We Said Today. We'll be back in another couple of weeks. So again, thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.